Nieuw gestart. En we zijn een uitstekende verbinding. Ja. Ah, nee, we zijn live. Hello, welcome everyone to this uh, summer school, the online edition. Uh, usually we have uh, 20 people who come to the Netherlands and enjoy uh, Utrecht. You can see a beautiful uh, picture here of Utrecht. And people would go on a pedalo and uh, see the grachten, the canals that uh, go through Utrecht. But this time things are completely different and I'm very happy you're joining us here in this online session. And it will be a bit shorter than usual. We'll have two days. Uh, today we'll have uh, from two to five and tomorrow another day of uh, three hours from two to five. And uh, well, as I said, I'm very happy you are all, all here. And to our big surprise, there are a lot of you. Normally we have about 30, maybe maximum 50 participants. And this year, at least the people who subscribed add up to a total of 479 from 36 different countries. So I, I decided not to say good afternoon because some of you will have a good morning. Some of you will be, uh, have a good night. Uh, anyway, I won't talk too long. I'll go through some uh, practicalities of you as far as you don't already know them. And then I'll give the word to Professor Paul Drijvers. So you can just have a look here uh, which countries are represented. We're very happy that you're all here and we hope you'll have the opportunity to uh, be interactive with us using the live chat screen in the bottom of your uh, own screen. Okay, so uh, all information I fortunately don't have to repeat because it's on the website for you. You've had enough mails containing the location of this website. So please go there if you want to know something about the program. If you want to know uh, what research pitches there are and you want to see them. And uh, if you want to know what to do to prepare for uh, a workshop or a talk. Um, all right, uh, tomorrow we'll tell you more about the certificates because if you're an active participant, then you have the right to a certificate. I want to say uh, one thing that's uh, just a very recent change is in the second channel that we use for broadcasting the talks. So I've updated the links on the website just uh, 15 minutes ago to a new channel. That's channel number two and it will be the di well different from the one we had half an hour ago. So, so just that you know, I saw some of you already subscribed to the second channel as well. And so that's not really necessary. The program will have kickoff with uh, Paul Drivers in about two minutes on this channel. Then uh, later today at three o'clock, there will be a parallel session. One will be me. Uh, and the level of this one will be uh, upper secondary. So if you're interested in the didactics of mathematics, upper secondary, this is your talk, I suppose. But uh, you could also go to Case Hoogland, who, who has a wider scope, actually, both primary and secondary school level, and he will talk about numeracy. So that will start at three o'clock. Then at four o'clock, we invite you to go to the first channel and watch the short pitches that participants have recorded about their own research. And please uh, leave questions and comments for these researchers, which they will happily uh, answer today and tomorrow so that there's some form of interaction. Because unfortunately, because of the large numbers of participants, this is by far not as interactive as we usually have our summer schools. But please make it as interactive as you can by leaving these questions and comments during talks and for pitches. And we end the day with a short closing in which we'll maybe discuss some of these uh, comments and questions and definitely do a short reflection on the day. So that's it from me for now. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, to you Professor Paul Drivers, who will talk about uh, realistic mathematics education. He's a full professor of mathematics education at our institute, the Freudenthal Institute. 
that's the inter uh, that's the institute that actually uh, organizes this uh, summer school and uh, I think a further introduction I leave to him whether he wants to say a bit more about himself uh, so here he is thank you oh there's a five to ten minutes break between each uh, part of the program so you can get yourself a drink and refresh and then uh, we can also set up the new technical parts of the next part okay see you Thank you very much, Rohir, um, for the introduction. Rohir Boss, my colleague at the Freudenthal Institute. It's a great pleasure to speak to you. It's a bit strange, I don't see you, but we are really excited, as Rohir already said, by this huge number of participants and a big interest in the work of our institute at Utrecht University. So my talk will be a kind of, so to say, crash course in realistic math education. I hope you had the opportunity to have a look at the, the, the um, preliminary tasks that Rohir already distributed and which we will discuss later on. So a crash course in realistic math education, RME as we abbreviate it, it's essentially an old theory in a sense that the big developers of it were uh, Hans Freudenthal and Adrie Treffers in the previous century. He received two very seminal books of the the two professors, but it is still alive, as you can see here. Two very recent books edited by my colleague Maya van der Heuvel Panhuizen. And interestingly enough, they are open access available, so you can really download the complete books at the links that you see below. And you will not have the time to copy the links, but the slides will be available. So it's old and it's still alive, and uh, I will explain to you, like I said in a very brief notice, some key aspects of the RME theory. I will set up a kind of shared vocabulary and I will reflect with you on RME task design. So these are the three main aims. Um, first an introduction to RME. Um, what do we mean by realistic math education? Well, it is a domain specific namely for mathematics, a domain-specific instruction theory on the teaching and learning. And it has been elaborated into a number of what we call local instruction theories. And these local instruction theories on the didactics of algebra, calculus, whatever, um, these local instruction theories also contribute to the whole picture of the overarching RME theory. Here you see um, some, uh, well, what should I say, a snapshot from a recent paper by Maya van den Heuvel, Panhuis and myself. This is a 2014 version. There is an update, 2020. And the red uh, sideline illustrates a quote. Realistic situations are given a prominent position in the learning process. These situations serve as a source for initiating the, the development of mathematical concepts, tools and procedures. So this is probably the most common view on RME that people have. And my hidden agenda, to be honest, is to kind of nuance this view. It all started out with Hans Freudenthal, who was a famous mathematician, but also he spoke like nine languages. He was in contact with many scientists in different domains worldwide. He was really a a very well-known uh, scientist and he said mathematics is not like the abstract uh, body of inaccessible knowledge out, out there or in heaven no it is something that we together develop we create it mathematics is human activity and in the heart of that is the process of mathematization which means that we make mathematics out of it out of what? Out of situations in our lives and maybe out of mathematics itself. So why did Freudenthal come up with those ideas? Well, Freudenthal said, well, on the one hand, usually in teaching mathematics, we present the things upside down compared to in the ways they were invented. And this is what he called anti-didactical inversion. We, as mathematicians, did a lot of work and once it's finished we tell it in another way 
to our students. And also, as a second point, Freud and us said, well, we had this mechanistic and structuralistic approaches to education. And on the right hand side, you see an example of this in an old fashioned textbook. And through this, you learn to carry out the procedures, but the type of knowledge that you will acquire and skills is not flexible and not applicable and in the end, not very useful. And um, to illustrate this human activity idea, the iceberg metaphor came up, which says that if you want kids to be able to add five plus two and to know that the outcome is seven, this is observable behavior. You can see kids do it, you can assess it, you can grade it, but this is only the top of the iceberg. The ability, the skill to perform this addition floats on a lot of pre previous experience and knowledge that kids have. They have been throwing dice, they have been counting on their fingers, they have been using some abacus, they have worked with the number lines. And all these experiences are like the, the foundations for the observable skill of adding five and two. Now, if you consider this as an iceberg, you only see the top of the iceberg above the water level. But if you say, well, this is what I want and I can reduce on what's below sea level and cut off the experiences that are the foundations for the procedural skill, then the iceberg will go down. If you cut the, the bottom part of the iceberg, it will sink a little bit and this your skill, the procedural skill of adding five to seven, will also get less well. So this is a nice picture to illustrate a bit the idea. Um, here on this slide you see a lot of, um, well, literature re um, reviews that you can um, consult if you want to know more about it. So far for the introduction, and now in this, like I said, crash course, I'm going to probably overwhelm you with some vocabulary that we use. Um, four key terms that I would like to briefly explain before we will revisit the tasks that you might have been working on already. These key concepts are mathematization, didactical phenomenology, the most impressive expression <laughs> to pronounce at least, use of models and guided reinvention. Now, first, mathematization. I already used the word, and it relates to um, what we call the activity princi principle, meaning that mathematics is a human activity. Mathematics is something that kids should do. Now, um, mathematization, um, very bluntly speaking, comes down to doing mathematics, making mathematics, making mathematics out of situations around you or out of situations that you encounter in one way or another. And our colleague Adri Treffers made the distinction already a while ago between horizontal and vertical mathematization. And um, to explain this, I use this type of um, figure. By horizontal mathematization, we mean going back and forth translating between realistic context, realistic problem situations, and mathematics. So you encounter a problem and you phrase it in mathematical terms and you create a mathematical model for it. And that's horizontal mathematization from the left to the right. And from the right to the left means that uh, if you have a mathematical model and you made some calculations or solutions, you can translate them back to the meaningful situation that you started with. So horizontal mathematization co corresponds to um, connecting the world within mathematics and the world without math uh, outside mathematics. And this is what RME is most well known of. A vertical mathematization means that you build within the world of mathematics your structures, your objects, your methods, there's more mathematics within mathematics, abstraction, for example, and a vertical mathematization is something that is a bit um, 
underexposed in the theory of RME, I think. Well, maybe not in the theory, but in the view that people have worldwide. So mathematization, in short, means making mathematics out of the situations that you encounter. And these situations can be real life, which refers to the horizontal, or can be already mathematical, which refers to the vertical. As a short example, I'm not sure if you can read it, this is part of a poster that 14-year-old um, students in the Netherlands made. And it was about a, a situation with fixed costs and variable costs. And at the top, you see then they are performing calculations. They're really like very close. They use the numbers of the problem situation. But on the bottom right hand side, you see the word formula underlined. And they are trying to set up some general rules which are no longer so much attached to the problem situation. So they start getting their own life and they are like moving from the world of the problem situation into the world of mathematics. So in my view, in this poster, I can see some elements of horizontal mathematization and of vertical mathematization. I'll come back to this in a minute. So mathematization means like making mathematics out of it and the out of it is out of problem situations around you or maybe problem situations within mathematics. Oh, there's a question. Yes. Has the iceberg been applied outside the context of mathematics in STEM? Not as far as I know. The iceberg, I'm not sure if you could hear it, the question was has the iceberg been used also outside the context of mathematics education or STEM education? As far as I know, not, but um, I'm not sure. And at least it would be an interesting thing to do. It would be a nice challenge to see if you could apply it elsewhere. So open for input on that. Thanks for the question. The second key word is uh, didactical phenomenology. And um, that relates to what we call the reality principle. Um, but what do we mean by reality anyway? Um, and Freudenthal wrote about that. Um, reality refers to what you experience as real. The highlighting is from me because this is the most important word. You as a student or as a pupil or as a teacher should experience the problem situation as real. And Adri Treffers said, um, reality is the world of the child and means that we try to identify the appearances of mathematical phenomena that fit the world of the child and that means to which the child can attach meaning. So reality, realistic, ref refers to meaningful. This is what Adri says here in my opinion. Um, so realistic can mean different things. It can mean feasible, doable. It can mean related to real life. But it can also be, mean meaningful, sense-making, or in Dutch referring to zich realiseren, namely to be aware of, to imagine. And in fact, it's the latter two meanings that I found far more important than, for example, the real life meaning. So, um, the, maybe the, the main point I want to make today is that realistic mathematics education does not necessarily refer to real life, but it refers to making sense, being meaningful to students. Okay, now the didactical phenomenology. This means, this re, uh, connects to the previous because the phenomenology, didactical phenomenology, is in fact like the arts of a teacher to um, identify phenomena, situations, contexts that um, are suitable to make sense to students, your target group, and to invite them to develop and understand the mathematics you want to teach, you want them to understand. So it's the art of identifying phenomena that are suitable and that back to be organized by the mathematical means that you want to teach. So 
to put it bluntly, didactical phenomenology means that you identify situations or tasks, contexts, that really invite the mathematics that you want them to, to think about in a natural, logical, meaningful way. Um, and these phenomena, this is the final line of this slide, they can come from real life, but probably the main thing is that they are experienced as real by your target group. And what your target group experiences as real, of course, is very dependent on student age, student level, country, culture, language, whatever. So this is a subtle question, how to identify these phenomena. But the main point is, take care of this. This is really the art of a designer and a teacher to pick out sense-making phenomena for those students, for this mathematics at that moment. Oh, and we have time for another question? Sure. Uh, the question is, uh, is the horizontal mathematization, the elaboration of the mathematical model, and the vertical one is working in and with the mathematical model? Yep. You can, yeah. Horizontal mathematization means involves setting up the model, design, yeah, setting up the model, creating the model. That's the one-way direction. But also, once you have the model and you're working in it, going back from the mathematical results to the problem situation. So it's going back and forth, but essentially, yeah, makes sense. And one more question that really fits what you just said. How real must the real phenomenon to study in primary school be? Yeah, good point. How real should the phenomena be? Um, if you don't mind, I will postpone this question because I'll come back to this in, uh, well, in a few minutes, okay? And remember if I forget it, but I will not. Well, this is an example how, maybe this is already part of the answer. This is an example of a primary school textbook series on division. And you have 18 males, as you can see. And my father, who is a tinkerer, has this nice box with drawers. And he wants to um, clean up his, uh, his desk and to put the nails into the drawers. And the first task is, I want to divide them, I want to uh, put them in three upper drawers. How do I do this? Now the idea is then that um, you open the three drawers and you do the nails one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. So in the end you will end up with six nails in each of the three drawers, right? This is what the designers have in mind. However, if you have ever been as a child with your father in his tinkerer uh, cabin and um, you saw him dealing with nails, you might know that he does this quite differently. He puts the big nails with the big nails in one drawer, the small ones the small ones, maybe um, different colors or different materials. So he has quite different ways of sorting them out than just fair division. So if as a child you know about this, you might be hindered by this problem situation to get into the idea of division. So um, this is real life, but not real, real life in the sense that a real tinkerer would not do it like this. So how real should real life be? Um, at least it should not hinder. And in this case, if I know more about the tinkerer and how he deals with nails, it might hinder me. Right? Um, okay. So I consider this not as an excellent example. And the main point of this talk is take care of uh, the examples you use because, well, there are dangers very easily. Models is important in realistic math education. And this relates to what we call the level principle. Um, Maya van der Heuvel Panheiser wrote already in 2003, models are representations of problem situations which reflect essential aspects of the mathematical concepts. And um, I think this is quite uh, share this idea. And as an example, you see some uh, models here. For example, at the lower, uh, at the bottom, you see a chocolate bar which can serve as a model 
for ratios I take there are one two three four five parts and I take one half of one part so one tenth etc um, the middle right hand side you see a ratio table uh, one if it connects to 9, 2 to 18, etc. So then the ratio table is a model for me to think about ratios to operate them. The upper right corner you see a number line on which we can jump and this is clearly um, a model for calculations, arithmetic calculations. And the middle top is a more complicated model. That's a tree model for algebraic uh, formulas or expressions I should say and we implemented this in a digital tool in our digital math environment so we have all kind of didactical models that should help students to understand what they are doing or maybe support their operations this is one way of looking at models but there's another way and that's the way by uh, Leem Streefland, Kuno Gravenmeijer, Maya van der Heuvel the model of model for distinction which is called immersion modeling and this connects a bit to this horizontal and vertical mathematization because the idea is as follows um, when you start working on a problem a meaningful problem you're often your thinking is very much connected to this problem situation like the nails and the drawers or whatever and your phrasing, your, your language is often related, connected to the situation. Um, and this is really, then you are really into the situation and a bit less maybe in the abstract mathematics, which is no point because this is how you usually start, I would say. The next level would be um, the referential level, which means that you're still manipulating the mathematics and operating in the original situation or contexts but you are not so much involved in the problem situation itself because you feel like okay this is my example this is my situation but in fact I'm a bit working a bit more in general and I'm referring to the problem situation but I start doing the mathematics more on its own However, if a student has problems at this level, you, as a teacher, refer to the problem situation. The third level, then, is the more general level, in which the focus is on the in-situation independent mathematical objects and solutions. And um, so the, mathematic, the meaning is more derived from the mathematics itself rather than from the original problem situation or contexts. Again, if students have difficulties at this level, you immediately fall back or go back to the, to the lower levels because then they need that the lower levels to attach meaning to the situation they're in. Roughly speaking, the situational and referential might fit better to the horizontal mathematization and the general level fits more to the vertical. And finally, we have the formal level which means that, um, in fact, you're, uh, you're also using more formal mathematical and conventional mathematical notation and terminology to express your mathematical ideas. So um, the idea of immersion modeling is that while learning mathematics, you usually go from a very concrete situational level to a more referential, general and formal level, and as a teacher, you might take this into account in, if you want to recognize um, where students are and where their problems are. Of course, not at every moment and not with every student you want to reach for the formal level. That depend, depends on your goals. Okay. Um, there are two questions to all. You have time? Sure. Depends there on you. More, but these fit. One question is, uh, what can we say about the relation between mathematical modeling, mathematical models, the way and the way it's used in RME? And the second question, uh, uh, how do you deal with uh, realistic means? 
uh, or relates to what people can imagine. What if students imagine different things? Okay. Um, indeed, the word modeling has really different meanings. And I just briefly address two of them. One is the use of what we call didactical models, like the ratio table of the number line. The other one is modeling in the sense of emergent modeling, like layers of understanding that students build. And indeed, a third meaning is mathematical modeling, which uh, yeah, refers a bit to this horizontal mathematization, I would say, and maybe to the lower levels in the four level model that I just presented. Um, yeah, but I did not pay attention to that because again, it's also a, again a slightly different meaning of the word, of the word modeling. And the other question was, um, of course, students will attach different meanings to, to the same situation or the same task. Um, that's a very general issue in teaching, of course, to in whole class teaching, for example, because not all your students are at the same point. So this is the very general issue of differentiation, um, which is hard to deal with, um, which I'm not going to address in this talk. But very generally speaking, the idea of RME is that the student is the starting point of the learning. So um, as a teacher, you would like to try to understand where the student is and what the things mean to him or her or don't mean or what's meaningful to the student uh, to build upon for the further learning. And that's, of course, quite a challenge for, for a teacher, especially if you have like 30 or 40 kids in front of you. Um, again, I'm going a bit quick in this crash course, but uh, in the light of the time, I will just continue for the moment for the fourth and final concept, guided reinvention. That's a relatively short one. Um, refers to the guidance principle. Sometimes uh, people say that, okay, if you want students to discover the mathematics themselves in a meaningful way, what's the role of the teacher? Well, Freudenthal had this claim, coined this expression, guided reinvention. Reinvention is that indeed, we do like students to create their mathematics in a meaningful way and in a natural way, um, which clearly outlines with a kind of constructivist view on learning. Still, we have to acknowledge, to admit that not all of our students are as clever and bright as Euler, Newton and Archimedes and Pythagoras together and if we want them to master the mathematics methods all these genius scientists have developed they might need some guidance. So students do need guidance from textbooks, online resources, peers, the teacher because we don't in the end want each student to follow their own idiosyncratic learning trajectory we also want them to end up with a kind of mathematical knowledge that they can communicate to others and that uh, is, has converged to common mathematical standards. So guided reinvention is a nice expression in my opinion because it highlights on the one hand the aim of students reinventing their meaningful mathematics and on the other hand the role of a teacher amongst others to guide them, to help them and to make sure that we will, in a way, end up with, with common mathematical knowledge. So, how do you do this? Well, there are different ways. My, my PhD supervisor, Kuno Gavamey, has said, well, what might be a helpful heuristic is think how you might have figured it out yourself. And another heuristic is have a look at the historical development of a mathematical concept. And these are two ways to think about ways how you can guide students. But a very important starting point is listen to the students, how they express themselves, where they are, what is meaningful to them, and try to connect to that. So, um, like I said, apologizes for this, uh, this quick amount of jargon. Um, but now we spoke briefly about four key concepts in RME. 
mathematization, like making and doing mathematics, didactical phenomenology, like identifying nice problem situations and phenomena that invite a specific mathematical development, the use of models, didactical models, and this layer model to know where students are, and the idea of guidance reinvention to express the aim of making students reinvent mathematics, but in the meantime, in the meantime guide them as a teacher. So this is nice, but how does this apply to specific tasks? And this is um, why I presented you with three tasks from Dutch textbook series. This task on the lawn was for like um, 14 to 15 year old students, 14 I guess, um, about a lawn in a garden, extending it. I should tell you that in the Netherlands we have a lot of gardens and a lot of lawns. 15 by 20 is a big garden, that's true. Most are smaller, but could, could happen. The second task about melting ice was for like 16 year old students um, who just had a graphing calculator to graph functions, and that's why there's the word plot in task C. Plot means use your graphing calculator to sketch the graph. And the third task is from a booklet which we edited uh, already a while ago. And um, the picture that you see on the left hand side was made in GeoGebra. I prepared a nice animation, but we added some technical issues. So I'm not going to show it to you. But there's this line which intersects the parabola in two points. And you draw the midpoint of these two intersection points and then you start moving the line up and down and um, you see what happens with this midpoint and it seems to move vertically and the question is is this really the case those were the three tasks and in the preparation that Rohir sent you um, the question was could you well first work on the task yourself and then could you tell us what you think about the realistic qualities of the contexts and the tasks? And um, there were some very nice comments. Thank you very much for the, all the input on the YouTube channel and some very uh, helpful insights. Also for me, interesting to read your opinions. I cannot react to all of them. So I would like to uh, get a kind of summary through uh, a poll, which we're going to do now. Um, if you consider the first task of this lawn, which is extended, I, I ask you two questions. Do you consider the task realistic and do you consider the problem situation realistic? For the moment, I just stick to one single task. Do you consider the task realistic? And my question is, if you could go to, uh, on your, maybe you have a smartphone or on your computer, to menti.com and use the code that you see there above and could you then please give us your votes if you think about the long task do you consider the task realistic and now I hope that I will have some votes coming in if not I will look at Ro here desperately yeah there's one vote okay good you have time for questions while people vote sure or does that mess things up I don't know. If you have voted, you can listen to me. What's the question? Uh, some people want to know about RME and multicultural classrooms. Is there anything you can say how RME could help in a multicultural classroom? Okay. In the meantime, please enter your votes, right? We have 20 now, but I would like to go up a lot. We have 185 people watching. Okay, great. So this is our ambition for the moment. Um, so how about RME in multicultural classrooms? Um, again, that's a challenge because if we take the RME point, starting point of problem situations and mathematical activity being, being meaningful, then the question is how does this meaning refer to these different cultures? I remember a very blunt example. 
we had a national examination here in the Netherlands on ice, uh, on I, something with, with snow and sn a lot of snow was in the task. And in uh, in Suriname and Curaçao, they had the same examination, which is in the uh, well, <laughs> a region where they don't have any snow. So this was quite a difficult task to imagine and to make sense of for the students there. So problem situations and context can be culturally biased. And if you teach RM in an RME way in a multicultural classroom, this is definitely something you should take care about. Okay, um, maybe um, this, this shows a clear image that people consider the long task as realistic, roughly speaking. I have the same question for the next task, so let's go on and please answer the same question for the ice cube task. You remember, do I need to do anything? Uh, I hope that you can answer now the ice cube task, whether you consider it realistic. At the bottom I see copy to your account over here, what does that mean? Press it? No. Should I press it? I think I should. Is there anybody who can vote for the ice cube task? I hope you can. I don't want to right now and then it's okay. not fair to me. Fair to me because I've already gone to the same code. Okay, and here's the third one. Does that work? Probably not either. Okay, then I will, uh, well, we had some votes for the first task, but now I will drop it for the moment. And I will just uh, continue. Oh, this is not what we want, right? I will just continue. Um, for this first task, um, many people considered it realistic and um, if I may be a bit provocative, I, am, I don't agree at all. Because the situation in the Netherlands of having a rectangular uh, lawn in your garden, this situation is realistic in a sense that it happens often and kids can imagine it, in the Netherlands at least might be different in other cultures. But if you want to extend your lawn, of course, you make a plan. Your garden is not, uh, well, has clear borders, I guess, so you cannot do whatever you want. So you make a plan beforehand. It's not that you do something and then afterwards see what you've been doing. Also, if you add a strip to your lawn, you have to carry those rolls of lawn and you you do it, you, it's a lot of work, heavy work. So, of course, you have an idea of the width of the strip that you are adding. So it would be very artificial to, to not knowing this. And in the unlikely situation that you don't know it, it's also very unlikely that you think, oh, okay, but I had a mathematics teacher and, and he said something about x, so let me set up an equation. And even in the very, very artificial situation that you would set up an equation here, then in task B, it comes up with the 374 square meters. But how can one ever know the 300, 374? There's only one way to know it. That is to measure the new extended lawn. But if you measure the new extended lawn, why not? And then multiply the two dimensions and get 374. Why not immediately mention the unknown value of x that you would like to know? So, in short, the problem situation is meaningful to students, but the elaboration into a task is really very artificial and not natural at all. So, if this is what we mean by, by RME, I'm afraid that RME comes down to teaching to students, okay, we have a silly tasks, it's not realistic at all, but please do what, you, what I ask you to do. And this is not at all what we want. Of course, I may be exaggerating a little bit at the moment, but the point I want to make is that 
a nice picture and a nice story does not in itself make a realistic mathematics task or a mathematical activity. And in this case, the task and the activity asks from our students to put off their common sense and to put their minds in mathematics mode and in trying them to, to find out what a mathematics teacher or a textbook designer might want them to do now. And this is not at all what we would like in mathematics. I hope you understand my point. The second one, the ice cube, as somebody in the, in the YouTube channel already highlighted, this is a bit more realistic in a sense there are some physics involved, but I guess an ice cube would never melt like this. An ice cube would melt and get more round and, and uh, well, a bit messy. It will not remain a clear, nice cube. And also the speed of 0 0.3 uh, 30 millimeter per, uh, per whatever, no, sorry, 1.5 millimeter per minute. This puzzles me because I could imagine it at the start, the surface touching the hot air is big, so it might melt quicker or slower, I don't know. So as soon as you start to know anything from physics, you are really confused by this task. So taking a problem situation from physics as a starting point for mathematics is nice, but again, the model here is, well, really puzzles me and um, confuses me and um, draws my attention away from the mathematical task. So again, even if the situation is interesting, the elaboration is not realistic in the sense that it's puzzling me as a student if I think about my physics course that I have next, next hour. Finally, the parabola task. Many of you said, well, this is less realistic, but if you think of a target group of like 16, 17 year old students, high achieving students, they've seen parabolas many times in their school career so far. So maybe they are quite familiar with parabola. And if I make them do the exercise in GeoGebra, they will encounter this phenomenon of the midpoint going vertically. So then the question, is this really true, can be a natural and a meaningful one. Again, depending on the situation, on the level, on the age, and on the way in which the teacher frames it. But this context or problem situation has at least the advantage that it doesn't have the limitations or the shortcomings of the previous two. So in this sense, this can be a very meaningful task in geometry, using GeoGebra or so, which invites some algebra. And from that perspective, it can be a very, really an RME task. So in short, because I have to think about the time, ah, I get some five minutes, so let me use them. I'm not one, I don't want to make a plea by claiming real life situations and contexts are nonsense and are not needed, not at all. I do want to make a plea to take care that you don't use context in a very artificial or confusing way or in a way that they lack opportunities for mathematization. And what we sometimes see is that people understand RME as, okay, I start a task with a story and then I do my regular mathematics with a very weak connection between the story and the mathematics. And that's, in my opinion, not what RME sets out for. So we are looking, and that's the didactical phenomenology, we are looking for situations that are meaningful for students, can be real life, very nice, but in a natural sense-making way invite for mathematics. So RME is much more than a task starts with a real life story. So an appropriate problem situation is meaningful to students can be a real life situation, but can also emerge from the world of science or the world of mathematics. And of course, this is largely dependent of the skills, competences, interests, age, culture of the students that are in front of you. So please take in, keep in mind that RME is different from 
real life stories. Even if, for example, with young students, um, it can be very important that the starting problem situation is really coming from real life, but it should be meaningful, recognizable experience that's meaningful to the students. So in short, to summarize, I try to, uh, in this crash course, outline RME as a domain-specific instruction theory. I try to make clear that reality refers to what students experience as real and meaningful. And mathematics is something you do. Next, I try to uh, briefly express four keywords, namely mathematization, doing mathematics, making mathematics out of it, didactical phenomenology as the art of identifying suitable problem situations or phenomena, that invite mathematics, the use of models, on the one hand didactical models, and on the other hand this level of emerging models, and guided reinvention as the role of the teacher or the uh, textbook uh, author to offer opportunities for students to reinvent mathematics, but in the meantime to offer enough guidance. And finally, the word of caution that I would like to express is Please be critical when you see real life situations in that they should not be artificial or puzzle students, but they do invite the mathematics that you want them to work on. And real life in that is not the main criterion. The main criterion is meaning making, sense making. And in that sense, uh, that students experience the task as meaningful. So, um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, thanks for attending the summer school. Enjoy the rest. And if there are any questions, I'm not sure if we have time for that at the moment. Rogier, please I guide just, me. I just promised that you would go uh, to this chat and would answer any questions that are left. Uh, uh, at the okay, stage. okay, nice promise. It's a pleasure. Um, thank you for your attention. Sorry for the... Uh, the density of vocabulary and uh, enjoy the summer school and I will see your questions in the chat window. Thank you. All right. I will take over. Yep, there you go. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we will be back very soon on this specific channel. I will interrupt the stream for a moment and then come back with a new stream and uh, there will be also a workshop on our other channel. I'd like to repeat what I said uh, in the beginning for some people will not have heard that. I've updated uh, the channel. We had a technical glitch 15 minutes before the start which made us change the channel. The right channel is now uh, on the website so just click the link in the program there for the workshop you would like to go to. And, uh, well, if that goes wrong, you can just search for the Freudenthal Institute channel. That will be the channel for the talk by uh, Kate Hoogland on numeracy. And this channel will be the channel for the workshop on the smooth slope to slide is a smooth slide to slope by me. Thank you for your attention here. Thank you for your questions. And I hope to see you soon.